Thanks for joining us for today's podcast. I'm Sean Schmidt with The Silver Sheet. On March 12th, the FDA released a final guidance related to medical device reprocessing and sterilization. In the document, the agency urges makers of reusable devices to evaluate the quality of instructions for use for such products and to validate that instructions are comprehensive and effective, among many other recommendations for industry. Although in the works for years, the guidance comes in the wake of several recent troubling cases in California and Illinois that involved patient infection and deaths due to improperly sterilized dudenoscopes. Yet for some device manufacturers, developing a product's instructions for use is an afterthought as they rush to get a device to market. In turn, poorly conceived instructions can lead to use error. Today's guests, Michael Wickland and Jonathan Kendler of UL Wickland Research and Design, are here to give you tips on writing effective instructions for use. Michael is general manager for the Massachusetts consulting firm, while Jonathan serves as its design director. Thanks for joining us today, gentlemen. It's our pleasure to to be part of this podcast today. My name is Michael Wickland. Jonathan, would you like to say hello? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Okay. Um, we appreciate the invitation today to talk about instructions for use as it pertains to medical device safety and ease of use. Um, Jonathan, we've we've uh, our title slide here talks about instructions for use, the un unsung usability heroes. What do we mean by that? Well, what we mean is that, historically, instructions for use have had a pretty bad reputation. A lot of people tend to disregard them, assume that users will automatically ignore them. And what we've seen is that they actually can be quite beneficial to the user experience if they're designed properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, in our business, as human factor specialists, we get involved in helping manufacturers address the new imperative to apply human factors engineering to make products safer um, as well as effective, uh, keying into the regulator's concern about safety and effectiveness. And there's a legacy now of uh, a lot of people getting injured and killed uh, by medical errors. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with the data that's been available for many years now from the Institute of Medicine, their estimate that thousands of people are dying each year due to medical errors. And Jonathan, um, I think the latest estimate was in the 200 to 400,000 range. That's a pretty big range. And that's not all people being injured by errors involving medical devices, right? Right. So that includes a wide range of different types of medical errors. Some of those might be due to other types of clinical mistakes, but it's pretty safe to assume that a decent number of them could be a result of the user interface of the product that's being used, for example. Yeah, and we get concerned about devices having intrinsic uh, user interface design flaws that could induce use error. Right. We are, we're particularly concerned these days, while well, we're, we're following the news um, about uh, superbugs uh, becoming uh, a consequence of improper device reprocessing and sterilization. I guess news coming out of California, and that triggered some uh, uh, pretty strong reaction from the FDA uh, with uh, implications for instruction design. Yeah, so the FDA's comments focus generally about the design of uh, reprocessing procedures and the reprocessing requirements for certain types of devices. But the FDA did highlight some of the issues associated with the instructions that manufacturers provide for reprocessing. They determined that even in cases where the reprocessing might not be too difficult for users to perform, it could be that the instructions are designed in a relatively poor way that actually leads users to reprocess the devices incorrectly. And so in some of the FDA's recent statements, they've explicitly asked manufacturers to reconsider the quality of their instructions and validate that their instructions are actually effective at helping users to successfully reprocess devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and it's not... It's, it's not finger pointing per se, suggesting that manufacturers are not uh, trying to come up with good instructions, but historically we see that when 
uh, the principles of human factors engineering uh, are not applied in instructional material design, but rather folks just focus on getting the content into a document that they think most people will ignore. That's where problems develop. Um, we learned that good instructions can uh, make a big difference in the quality of user interaction with the device or performing associated tasks, such as cleaning and sterilization. Uh, but bad instructions can indeed induce harmful use errors. Uh, bad instructions might induce harmful use errors by deterring people from paying attention to the instructions, which might lead them to overlook uh, critical steps in whatever processes they're, they're uh, uh, in the middle of performing. Uh, it could uh, lead them to overlook warnings. Uh, Jonathan, uh, you're, you drew this picture. I'm going to blame you for such fine artwork. Uh, what's happening here? We, we are uh, we're causing people to make mistakes by virtue of instructions not being as good as they could be? Yeah, essentially, bad instructions can actually be magnets for use errors. They can lead people to make mistakes that they might not even make if they were just trying to use the product based on their intuition. And we see that from time to time in usability studies. We recently conducted a study of an inhaler, for example, where we compared the performance of people just following their own intuition when using the device for the first time and people trying to follow the instructions provided with the product. And we saw that because of fundamental design flaws, things like the layout of the instructions being unclear, users were performing some of the steps in an incorrect order. Because some of the drawings in the instructions didn't have a proper focus on the key details in the product, they ended up interacting with the wrong part of the device, where we saw that people who were just following their intuition were able to correctly intuit which part of the device they needed to press to actuate uh, inhalation, for example. And we've seen that routinely in various uh, usability studies. And so we've come to the conclusion that in some cases, a good IFU, one that is designed to meet good practices for layout, for technical writing, and for various other characteristics that we'll talk about later, can actually help avoid use errors that could lead to, to dangerous, dangerous issues. And yeah. uh, Michael always liked to talk about the fact that it's not in every case that it's going to prevent the problems. But Michael, why don't you tell us about your trademark line? <laughs> trademark line. Well, you know, it goes back to the days where I did a lot of work on warnings. And I used to tell people who would suggest that warnings are ineffective. I used to say, well, some warnings help some people some of the time. I used to enjoy pointing out that a beach that has a warning indicating that there's sharks in the water uh, usually keep people out of the water. Um, I'm going to apply that to instructions and say that some instructions are helpful to some people some of the time, meaning that we don't want to depend on them solely as a risk mitigation, meaning that uh, you know if we put instructions in place or have a poster that tells people how to properly clean and sterilize an instrument, that that's always going to be enough, uh, but it's a good start. Sometimes instructions such as that will be very helpful, but we're not going to claim that they're the perfect risk mitigation. Uh, but we think that we, manufacturers more broadly speaking, owe it to users, uh, the people interacting with technology in various ways. We owe it to them to give them good instructions that encourage them to pay attention to the instructions and follow them. And uh, we've seen instructions drive good performance, both in the kind of validation usability testing we get involved with, but also in the performance of real world tasks in the field. So um, Jonathan, quick reference guides. Do you, uh, are those instructions? Are, uh, what is your opinion about their effectiveness? We talked about instructions, the unsung hero. Reference, quick reference guides fit into that, don't they? Yeah, so quick reference guides certainly count as one form of instructions. And it's worth clarifying that when we're speaking about instructions, we're speaking broadly. 
we're not talking only about the conventional user manual, the kind of 200-page black and white document that's very text-heavy. Historically, those have been the instructions that manufacturers provided with medical devices. But these days, we're seeing a broader range of different types of documents and different types of information. So the quick reference guide, what's typically a, a, a one to five page document, more visual, less text heavy, is something that we're seeing more and more frequently with medical devices. And our studies show that they do tend to be quite effective because they provide information in a concise manner that users can employ as they're performing a task. Another example of a different type of instruction that also is, is typically quite useful is the on-product instruction. So in the slideshow that we're sharing, we're showing one example from a defibrillator where a series of graphics lead the user through the basic task of setting up and operating the device. And that's an important consideration to make, where the instructions will actually appear. So Michael, you always talk about the importance of actually presenting information at the point of care. Yeah, this illustration shows how a quick reference card or an instruction sheet can be uh, somehow attached or otherwise in, you're, you're ensuring that it's available at the point of care because if you develop instructions and they end up at a central nurse's station or in the biomedical department's library or hidden behind other equipment, that's not going to be particularly helpful. One could also envision besides cards hanging from devices or in a little slot, you could imagine them on a poster on a wall. I recall, Jonathan, we we developed a poster at one point for a dialysis clinic where there were some important safety measures that needed to be communicated uh, continually to dialysis technicians about making sure that needles stayed in people's arms rather than having the patient's blood spilling out on the floor because a needle wasn't properly taped down and observed from time to time. So I'm a big fan of keeping the critical information with the product. Sometimes the product can, uh, can actually provide the essential guidance, right? Yeah, so especially in some of the newer, more technologically advanced products, we're seeing a lot of animated and interactive tutorials that are either embedded right into the product itself or potentially provided as uh, an online reference, for example. So this is something that can be very helpful in cases where you're trying to demonstrate a more complex procedure. And in some cases, some of the sterilization processes that users have to follow to reprocess their devices can be pretty complex. And even though an animated video might not be something that the user accesses regularly, it could have a big impact on their first interactions with the product. They tend to be quite effective during the initial training that users receive with a given device. Right. You know, everybody likes top 10 lists. Let's uh, talk about some of the principles for effective instruction design. Jonathan, you've mentioned several of them. Uh, one of the most important things to do is to draw the person's attention to the instructions rather than having it be overlooked. Um, another key point is to make sure that instructions speak in the reader's language, and that might not just simply mean English, Spanish, or Chinese, for example, but rather in terms that the per person uh, will understand rather than professional jargon, to present the right amount of information rather than to intimidate the user or simply turn them off by having too much information. Conciseness is very important. Uh, there are some other key tips. Uh, perhaps, Jonathan, you could walk us through the rest. Yeah, so the other ones might seem very obvious once you've designed a few instructional materials, but even basic things like numbering the steps, highlighting salient details are things that sometimes get overlooked. Many times just because manufacturers leave the design of the instructions toward the later stages of product development. And we find that when you consider it as part of the actual user interface design, think about how the instructions fit into the overall workflow, there's a lot more of an opportunity to make sure that these principles are met, that the graphics are high quality, that the critical warnings and cautions appear in the right place. And importantly for reprocessing tasks that the instructions are provided in a dur durable format that will actually withstand the use of the product. Yeah. You know, there's nothing better than a before-after example. On the left-hand side, we're showing instructions that perhaps use a good heading, the sentences might be short, the language might be appropriate, 
but there's something about those instructions that are not compelling. Looking at all text instructions, kind of feel it feels like work to go through them. Whereas on the right hand side, we're uh, illustrating some of the principles we just talked about, including numbering the steps, using graphics, keeping the words limited and concise, and and dividing a task up into its logical components. There, my sense is that if we showed these two examples to a large number of people, and indeed we have in the past, uh, you would see an almost unanimous uh, uh, preference for the ones on the right-hand side. Yeah, It's important to mention though, that preference isn't the only thing that matters. With instructions, as with the devices themselves, what really counts is how effectively people can actually use the instructions and follow them to operate a device correctly. Right. You know, one of the most common things we will do to evaluate instructions is have people sit with them, uh, sit with prototype instructions, have them go ahead and try to perform tasks uh, following those instructions. There are times where we might let the instructions be in the environment in more of a passive way to see if people pay attention to them. But then uh, specifically focusing on whether people can complete tasks when they follow those instructions. And this harks back to the, uh, the point that the FDA made in their guidance, which is they want to see proof that people will be able to follow instructions to properly clean and sterilize instruments as one example. So we should wrap up, Jonathan. Podcast is supposed to be short. Yeah. Well, I think we can wrap up on a, a positive note and, and talk just a little bit the bright, about the bright future ahead. I, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, in the past, manufacturers have had a relatively negative opinion of the use of instructions. I think now that manufacturers and usability specialists in particular are starting to pay a bit more attention to instructions, there is a bright future ahead. There is a potential for better designed instructions and ones that actually enhance the user experience rather than get in the way of somebody being able to use a device effectively. Mm -hmm. And so I take it the, uh, again, credit to Jonathan for these fine uh, bit, bit of graphics here. Uh, you're showing the sun rising in an optimistic future. Um, I agree with you. Uh, instructions, are, you might think that they're old school, uh, but I think actually there's a bright future for putting high quality instructions in front of users and making sure that they work well by doing the validation testing that the FDA is referring to. So while the sun is rising and everything's optimistic, I think we're out of time. Jonathan, we should uh, head off into the sunset. Yes, good idea. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for listening to our podcast. We hope it helped you. Michael and Jonathan, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation, and thank you for listening. Check back soon for another podcast.